Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin, and welcome to this week's episode of the Podiatry Legends Podcast. The podcast is on to help you feel, see, and think differently about the podiatry profession. With me today, I have a Scottish podiatrist. Her name is Shannon Clark, and she is in Troon, Ayrshire. Did I get that right? Yes, 100%. I did. All right, that's right, because I was saying before, Ayrshire sounds like air fryer. Just all you do is just try and get that out without messing it up. So that is fantastic. <laughs> So, Shannon, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. I'm going to point out to everyone that how you end up on here was, and this is the power of social media, is you posted an article, I think it was in UK Podiatry uh, mm -hmm. Facebook page, and there was an mm -hmm. article written up about you, and I've got the article in front of me here, and it was about you becoming a registered scientist, which was I thought yeah. was really cool when I read this. And I read through the whole article, and I said, I've got to get you on the show to talk about this because I think more people will be excited about it. And you can tell by yeah. the amount of posts and comments that people mm -hmm. are on Facebook. But before we get there, I want to step back a little bit and find out what got okay. Shannon excited about podiatry. Why, why podiatry? How did you get into it? How did I get into it? If I had a pound for every person that asked me that. <laughs> it was always healthcare. Um, and I love talking to people and enjoying hearing their stories and everything like that. But podiatry is such a broad uh, clinical field that you deal with all sorts of patients. And I think that population, um, you don't know what's going to walk through the door, mm. is the best feeling. Because you know somebody's usually in pain when they come into your chair and they walk out feeling so much better. And it's a kind of, it's quite a nice wee pat on the back that, oh, I've made that person feel better. And I know that they'll come back and see me when they know that they don't have to suffer anymore um, it's such an innovative field as well there's so many avenues that people can go down um, and there's always good job stability with it because not many people <laughs> want to do it no I know because some people say oh do you have a foot fetish and you go yes what makes, what makes you uh -huh. think that I would have a foot fetish just because I do but I do do, <laughs> I do think, optometrists I have an eye fetish did. well I think yep. if you did have a foot fetish this job would cure you <laughs> <laughs> you reckon you'd give it away after a while wouldn't you yeah, you do uh -huh. see some Yep. Do you see some manky things? But because uh -huh. you said that healthcare was what you were interested in, so you knew you wanted to go mm -hmm. down that health field. When you were looking yeah, through uh -huh. all the professions, was there something that jumped out about podiatry? You went, oh, that is the one? Because you could have done optometry, dentistry, you could have yeah, done anything yeah. else. I don't know. I think it's because, this is going to sound ridiculous, a lot of these other um healthcare fields you're in people's personal space whereas you're not in podiatry you can oh, true. you're at the opposite end of the body they can talk to you the whole time like if you're obviously a dentist or a hygienist they can't have a conversation with you so you're getting the best of both worlds you're talking to them but you're not in anybody's personal space <laughs> yeah my brother's yeah. a dentist and i always say the reason he chose that is because he likes to talk more than me and he doesn't like the other person getting a word in so it's almost no. fantastic i know when i've seen him I'll get there, I won't talk too much. Then he'll put his hands in my mouth with 14 instruments and then go, so anyway, how's your day been? <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> they always wait till they've got your hands in your mouth and start asking you questions and you think, I don't know how you think I'm going to answer that. Now, he always said that I used to mumble a lot when I spoke and he said that set him up really well for dentistry because he could understand patients with <laughs> instruments in their mouth. So I went, oh, 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 oh. It makes sense. Yeah, very funny. <laughs> so from the time you started podiatry, you knew straight away that you had chosen the right career? Yes, when I was treating patients. But my year at uni was the first year that started to do personal foot care in the UK. So we started discharging a lot of patients, um, done them that they could cut their own toenails and things like that. So we had quite a hard year, I think, and a lot of my um uni students dropped out so okay. it was hard getting through uni but I knew doing all the practical side that I had to get through the kind of tough times to qualify essentially and ever since I started I loved it. Where I've did loved you study? Treating... Uh, Glasgow Caledonian. There's okay. only two universities in Scotland that do podiatry so there's Glasgow Caledonian and uh, Queen Margaret in Edinburgh. When you graduated did you go straight into private practice? Yeah, I've always done private podiatry. I worked in Glasgow before for four years. So you, when you it's graduated, good... you never thought about yeah. going into the NHS first, straight to private practice? Straight to private practice. 
I think the NHS is quite tough to get into and the difference between NHS working and private working, it's quite a bit. You you create your own uh, clinic and you can choose what kind of patients you want to see. Whereas in the NHS, I think you don't always know what's walking through the door. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, literally. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, and it could be anything. <laughs> uh, like, for so, us, come, like a box of chocolates, you don't know what you're going to get. Yeah, uh huh. <laughs> Could be anything sometimes. So with going into private practice, so that's that's the path you went down. Were you after a clinic that covered all aspects of podiatry, or was there a certain area of podiatry that floated your boat more than something else? I like all aspects except musculoskeletal. Um, oh right, okay. Biomechanics, biomechanics isn't my thing. I'm just not very good at it, and I never have been. So I would do anything except that. <laughs> I yeah, love nail surgery. Enough. I love things like that. Just being, just helping patients. That's fair enough. Because you get other people that will go, oh, no, I just wanted to get a job in a sports clinic just doing MSK. And I never wanted to see another corn or a callus or mm -hmm. do any mm -hmm. general work whatsoever. So I think it's good that you have both. You've got some people yeah. that like one thing and are just not sort of, doesn't really interest them doing another part. Yeah. Yeah, and I think if you're not as good at something, then why pretend you are? I'm quite honest with anybody that all my patients, if they ask me things, I'll say this isn't my specialty, but I'll try and help you as much as I can. And I think they're more appreciative if you tell them that there are podiatrists that will be better at this kind of thing, um, yeah. and then they can go and find them, I suppose. So um, at the moment, when did you graduate? <clears throat> 2017. Okay, so this is your sixth year. You're still working mm -hmm. for somebody else. You haven't got your own practice, have you? Yeah. No, I haven't oh. got my own practice, no. Having my own uh, practice isn't something I've ever really thought about. Seems a lot of responsibility. <laughs> it, it is. <laughs> yeah. I, some, I know some people, I, geez, you know what I like talking to you is just your honesty. And there's a lot of people that fall into the thing, yeah, well, they graduate. I know I have to do MSK. I hate it, but I'm gonna ha I have to do it because I'm supposed to. No. You decided you didn't want it, mm -hmm. and you've already made decisions. Yeah, having my own business isn't something that really interests me, and it seems like a lot of work. Well, it is a lot of work. Yeah, I've I've worked for two ladies that are both both have their own clinics, and I've seen the nonsense that goes on behind it, yeah. and the stress that they take home with them. And they both of them have families, whereas I don't. So I obviously I don't have that responsibility either. But I've watched them, and I think no, I don't want to. Yeah. I'll quite happily work for somebody else. And when I finish at five o'clock, I'm leaving my job and not taking it with me. And, <laughs> and I think sometimes that's a bit awful to say, but <laughs> it's as if you take your scrubs off and that's your done. I think more podiatrists should really consider whether uh -huh. they want to have their own practice or not, because yeah. some will open their own practice because they think, oh, that's the natural progression. That's what I must do yeah. next. Mm -hmm. And they do a really, this will sound bad, a really shit house job. They're no good at it. <laughs> they they no. would have they would have no. been better and the profession would have been better if they had just kept working somewhere else and asked for a pay yeah. rise uh -huh. and got the pay yeah. rise. Then working in some of these clinics that they set up, that are just they're just no good. And they, yeah. and they don't seem and they're yeah. not happy. No. And I think patients always have a story of another podiatrist. And you know what patients are like, but they always have a story of somebody else that they've seen and it's not always good. And you no. think, oh, I don't want to be that person that they're talking about to the next podiatrist. Yeah, that's true. Whereas, yeah, I always worked for myself. I loved the pressure. I loved everything that came with it. I loved the long <laughs> hours. I I just enjoyed it. I really, really enjoyed it. So for me to go and work for somebody else, I would probably would have driven yeah. them nuts. I would have gone, oh, have you thought awful. about doing this? Have you thought about doing that? Maybe we should do this. Yeah. It just, it, it wouldn't be in me to, at 5, 5.30, to walk away, close the door and not be able to think about yeah. it until the next day. I couldn't do it. So no. I take my hat off to anyone who can <laughs> actually do that. And we need, we need more. We need more Shannons out there. Yeah. But I see posts on the UK podiatry page all the time and people are stretching themselves so thin. Mm. And I think that's fine when you are maybe like – mid 20s to maybe mid 40s whatever but I know what sometimes my back feels like when I've worked quite a long day so I can only imagine how they feel and I think no there's a 
there's no need for you to feel stressed and pressurized and sore because of well, your job. Yeah. I, I, and- I work to live, not live to work, I think. And I know that's an awful thing to say as well. No, I don't think so. I, it's funny, like it's it's easy in hindsight because yeah, like I'll, I'm old now, so and I've been around, <laughs> yeah, been in a profession, but I've worked 35 years this year, so it's easy in hindsight to look back and go, I, oh, you don't need to work as hard as what you did, but seriously, you don't need to work as hard. It doesn't pay off in the end. All it does is create no. stress. Yeah. And I think we are, because of the profession we're in, we feel sorry for patients. So when they come in asking for appointments or, or begging, oh, I'm going on holiday tomorrow, you say, right, OK, I'll do it just this once. But it's never just this <laughs> once. You'll do the same for the next person. Yeah, I must admit, even I did that every now and then. You'd squeeze somebody in because it was like they had they were going away or something. But I didn't do yeah. it too often, mm-hmm. though. I wasn't that nice all the time. So sometimes it, it is that... The caring side yeah. when you do something with mm-hmm. somebody else, whether you squeeze them in or you stay a little bit later for them, I think that's part of how, what a lot of podiatrists are like. I'm not saying that I was like that yeah. in my clinic all the time. Very mm. rare. Very <laughs> rare for me to be <laughs> to be super nice. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the other the other progression that sometimes happens as well is when people have a clinic, and I don't know if this has happened with the people you've worked for, but all of a sudden they feel, oh, I must have a second clinic. Or I must expand, yes. or I must work over here, mm-hmm. and they realise every time you expand, it's not double the money, but it will sometimes be double the stress, and you've got to be able to manage mm-hmm. that. And I think a lot of podiatrists try and open another clinic with the same staff that they've got that yeah. are already struggling to work in the one clinic, and then all of a sudden they're between two, and then someone leaves. So it's why a- did you change? Yeah. If you can talk about it, why did you move from one job to the other? If this is your second one now. I- I think in my first job I loved. I loved the team. I loved all the people. I don't have anything bad to say say about them, and I still keep in touch with them all. Oh, that's good. But I think I just got a bit stuck, um, kind of seeing the same patients all the time, and also um, I had to travel to my last job, so I got a bit fed up of that as well. So I decided I just needed a change, and um, I applied to work in Trun, and I think. Um, Trin is the nicest place ever and I see yeah. the sea every day and the beach makes me happy so <laughs> oh yeah it's no a happy place. so out of curiosity <laughs> yeah. you said you had to travel how far did you have to travel I always laugh at UK distances because <laughs> it's, it's sort of like around the corner for us here in Australia so how far did you yeah, have to travel you're, you're going to laugh yeah. it was half an hour which was 23 miles <laughs> <laughs> so it's not far at all in the grand scheme of things but when you're here, it feels like ages. Oh no! In the UK, that's a that's a long way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, and the roads are like car parks. Yeah, I think capital cities around, especially capital cities in Australia, if you only have to yeah. travel half an hour. I remember one job when I'd sold my practice and before I moved to Cairns, and I did a job for six months working at a at a hospital. And to go from where I was living to get there, it was about an hour and fifteen, hour and twenty minutes one way. <laughs> And I, you know, I enjoyed the drive and I, I'd be listening to the radio. There were certain things that I, I quite enjoyed about it. But after about six months, I was like, nah, yeah. I, no. can't do, I can't do this anymore. No, it was, it was it's a long start. time. And it was before podcasts too. So if there had been podcasts around then, I would have smashed it. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to move on to you becoming a registered scientist. Mm-hmm. Please take me through this process on... Becoming now is this just a, a UK thing? Becoming a registered scientist? I'm not sure. It, if if you're registered with the um, podiatry um, the council um, or the College of Podiatry, sorry, you can apply for it. It's whatever your professional body is, as long okay. as they're registered with the science council, you can do it. Okay. Um, so if anyone in Australia knows any information about it, please, if you're listening to this. Yeah. Send me an email, Tyson at podiatrylegends.com, and I will update the notes or put some things in some of the Facebook groups to let people know. So why did you want to become a registered scientist? So I think I consider myself not to be particularly academic, and I think the next step, podiatrists automatically assume, is doing your master's. Yeah. Um, and I think when you've been out of uni for six years, jumping back into something like that isn't an easy feat, I don't think. So... Um, 
I had a conversation with my boss, um, Vicky Cameron, who is one of the smartest women I, I know. She has her PhD. She um, sits on the Research Development and Innovation Council. She um, she has her chartered scientist. So we had sat down one afternoon and she had said, what about the Science Council? And I had said, I, I don't know what that is. I've never heard of that. <laughs> so um, she had said, why don't you look into it and, and see what you think? And I looked at it, um, and it's it's basically a kind of quality assurance system for people working in science. So we don't ever think as podiatrists we are working in science, but when you look at what the scientific principles are, um, we do it every day. We we look into research, we look at evidence, um, we repeat a lot of processes to see if it works, and if it doesn't work, we try something else. It's true. So I thought, do you know what? Let's do it. So uh, Science Council kind of sets um, standards for professional registration. Um, it's as if you're held accountable, I think. Um, and then you are put on the red, admitted to the register when you've met the competent, competence and conduct <laughs> requirements. Um, and there's four different um, types of scientists. So you can be a chartered scientist or a chartered scientist technician. Um, both of them, as I say, you need your master's for. And then um, you can be a registered scientist or a registered scientist technician. Um, so obviously I applied for the registered scientist. Um, the whole process took maybe about eight weeks. And it was actually really interesting delving into your past as a podiatrist, I suppose, looking back at patients that maybe you never thought that you were applying scientific principles to, mm. but they were really good examples of it. So the Science Council says that the definition of the scientists are all united by the relentless curiosity and systemic approach. And I think we do have good curiosity. We, we find out about patients, but if one thing isn't working for them, we want to find something else that will help them. And I think it's such a good thing to have looking back into your past, as I say, and just thinking, do you know what? Actually, I'm a good podiatrist and I've helped quite a lot of people over the years. So it's it's quite a good pat on the back as well. Um, it's, it was really interesting to do. Yeah, well, what I think is interesting, and you, ha you wrote this in your article, or they wrote this in the article, was a lot of times when people think scientists, they think lab coat. Yeah, and test tubes, and that's that's mm -hmm. a scientist. Yeah, a, a crazy hair. Yeah. If you're a mad scientist, uh -huh. and the goggles. <laughs> yeah, and they and dress just badly. So you've got this image yeah. of what a scientist is, and I think mm -hmm. they've got scientists mixed up with you know sort of like a a lab technician or like uh -huh. people yeah. that are just doing scientific work in a lab. But us being in a clinical situation, like you said, we do see patients. We repeat the same treatment. Mm -hmm. on on different patients yeah. and you get a different outcome and through those yeah. outcomes you have to then go okay that didn't work but it's worked yeah. four times before why isn't it working this time uh -huh. and as the years yeah. go on you start identifying things about patients and footwear and activities and occupations mm -hmm. that you do start collecting yeah. this like this this massive database of knowledge in your head yeah. that we don't share yeah we keep it all to uh, ourselves. Uh, it's in there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think a lot of people think podiatrists just see the feet, whereas, as you say, you see the whole person, you look at them holistically, you see what they do on a daily basis, how they work, what their activities are, and then the person that worked before for might have been very sedentary where the next person is active and you've got to think, well, what works for that first patient isn't going to work for the second patient because they lead to completely different lifestyles. So as you went through it, what how long was the process to from start so, to finish? About eight weeks. So the application process is all online. Um, you can do it through the Science Council website or you can do it through your regu regulatory body. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, you need your CV, an updated version of your CV, details of all the certificates and your qualifications, um, and you upload them all onto the website. Um, then it is a set of questions. So what was your motivation for applying? Um, then you need your me membership ID, so the college, um, the HCPC. Uh, you need a supporter. Um, so my boss supported me. She um, read it. Uh, every time I kind of started to, to submit wee bits, she read it and made sure I was on the right track. Um, some details about yourself. 
and you need to um, pay for it. And then you start doing a competence report, which is the main body of it. So that's the bit that takes the longest. Um, so the competence report is a question section where you delve into your experiences as a podiatrist and apply scientific principles to these. So your knowledge and understanding of the, the evidence-based learning. And then at the end of it, you do a dec declaration where you agree to the um, CPD standards and the registrant code of conduct. So you need to say you continue with your CPD um, and make sure you're following all the, the standards. Um, and then the application is reviewed. So it gets sent obviously to the Science Council and they sit, I think they sit on a panel. So for me, it was the, I think it was the Research Design and Innovation Council. So as I say, my boss sits in that. So she sat on it with a couple of other podiatrists from across the UK and they all I think they all read it and then decide, yes, um, there's enough information here for us or obviously no. Um, and because Vicky sat in that um, meeting, she found out that I had got it before I had. And she also um, found out that I was the first podiatrist in the UK to have the registered scientist title, which okay. is exciting. You mentioned something about you, you signed something to say that you'll continue doing the CPD, but is that podiatry CPD or is it, or do they have a different type of CPD that they want you to maintain? No, I think it's podiatry CPD, but I think it's more reflective because um, I don't think a lot of podiatrists do reflect on their practice, but it, it seems to be a kind of more reflective um, side of it, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah. It does make sense though, because like we were just saying before about different patients and re repeating the same treatments and get different outcomes and having to work around that. I think if everybody just sat back and reflected on just the patients you saw over the last week and what did you learn? And you and you recorded that down and then next week you did the same thing. What did I learn this week from my patients? I reckon yeah. every uh -huh. week you would learn something. Yeah. But because we go from one week to the next week to the next week and we don't reflect, mm -hmm. some of those some of those learnings, I think we lose them. We, yeah, I think so. We don't sort of capture those learnings. We probably do, but I think if we if we thought about it more, we, we would probably learn more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Last week, um, our clinic was just so busy. I treated 60 patients. And I think um, if I was to sit down and reflect on those patients, it, you would, as you say, you would learn something completely new, but it, it's the time to sit and do it, and it would be quite interesting to see how different weeks would, yeah, change. And also, amongst if there's more than one practitioner in the clinic, if you both sat there and yeah. pulled out half a dozen patients mm -hmm. that you thought were really interesting, and they did the same yeah. thing, and you sat down for an hour and you reflected on each other's patients, and they asked you a question, oh Shannon, by the way, why did you do that? or what made you choose that yeah. course of treatment, or how did you get that outcome? Mm -hmm. That's not what I normally get. You would probably, yeah. oh, the amount of learning you would get from each other. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. I think that's why you see, um, you know, when you watch it, only ever see it on those medical shows on TV, when, I'm not sure if they do it when somebody, only when somebody dies and they pull them all in a room and they, yeah. they ask a lot of questions they and they're really asking, trying to dig into it to find out why did this part, why mm -hmm. did this person not make it? And yeah. and, every, and there's a lot of people sitting in who are watching it because they know this is a great learning opportunity. Yeah. So definitely reflective, reflective learning. Yeah, I think it's it's definitely a good thing, a good tool for your clinic. I assume you would recommend anyone who has the opportunity of doing this should do this if they're not going to do. Yeah. Like yeah, if, they're not I do, think if they don't so. want to do a masters or anything, this would be a great thing to do. Yeah, I think it's a stepping stone for sure. It's getting kind of back into academic writing um, and like actually physically giving yourself time to sit down and do it because you know you've kind of got a time scale to do it. Whereas if you're just maybe looking at CPD day to day, you don't, you can go a few a few weeks without looking at anything, whereas, you know, oh, I've got to submit this by a certain time. And if you give yourself time skills, you'll do it. Yeah. And I also think, um, as I say, I've never considered myself academic. I, I don't think writing is my strong suit. But when you actually look back at everything that you've achieved over the years and 
when you're writing it, it makes you think, no, do you know what? I can push myself to do something that I am a bit more uncomfortable with and push myself out of my comfort zone, which I think as podiatrists, we don't always do. We kind of get lost in that day-to-day routine and we just, we can get a bit stagnant. Oh, yes. It's easy to, you know, they say you just get in a rut. Well, they say a mm-hmm. rut is just the grave with the ends kicked out, that you just keep doing <laughs> the same thing day yeah. in, day out. Yeah. And and sometimes you don't think about it. You'll do that half hour drive no. every day yeah. and you just hop in the car. Oh, look, have you ever driven mm-hmm. somewhere and you get somewhere, you get out of your car and you can't remember even driving there? Yeah. You just go in a daze. I found that even when I have guests on the podcast here, a lot of people will come on here and and they just and they enjoy that this has broken up their day of what they were normally yeah. playing for the day they go this was because we're talking afternoon my time which means it's morning your time yeah half past eight yeah so you'll probably go it's an interesting way to start the day yeah i think so and i, I think i was really nervous about doing it because i don't know what you're going to ask it could be it could be horrible but well, you're you not did, so. you asked me you said me oh can you send me questions yeah. i said no uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I said, and when I don't you know said what that, I'm gonna I, ask. I thought, oh, all right. So the other day I spent, oh, like I, I spent maybe about half an hour, 45 minutes sitting going, what might you possibly ask me? And I wrote down loads of stuff because I thought, oh, I don't like going in and not being prepared. Yeah, that's, that's how I live <laughs> my scary. life. No, it's one of those things. The reason <laughs> I, the only question I normally ask people is what got them into podiatry. And and I'll also know why I wanted you on as a guest. So I just assume that you know it's <laughs> you know the content, and and yeah. that's why. And I also think if I have set questions, I don't and I don't ask the questions. And you've put all this time and effort into for that. Yeah. But the conversation uh-huh. went in a different direction. You two be mm-hmm. shits with me, and and I don't want <laughs> I don't want all my guests to go half my guests go. Oh, I didn't ask me any of those questions I'd written. I had prepared for. Well, I do have another question for you, though. Mm-hmm. Is uh, and this is my last question, though a tough one anyway. Is in the end of the article, it says, "Like most people, I suffer from imposter syndrome." Mm-hmm. Did you mean by that? Yeah, I think I've, especially in my job just now, I've worked with two really, really clever people. They, as I say, one has a PhD, one the other one's working towards a PhD. Um, and I've never felt that um, <laughs> I'm not smart. I'm just not as smart as them. And I think when you have that feeling, there's always a feeling of doubt. Yeah. So when you kind of doubt yourself, when you're working with two really brilliant people, you think, oh, I'm never going to be like that. There's no point in even like stepping foot outside this comfort zone that I have made for myself for absolutely no reason. Because why not? Like, now I think, what have I got to lose? If I try it and I don't like it or I try it and I don't achieve it, so what? You've tried it, you know. But there's just that wee voice inside your head going, yeah, but you're just not as good as them. And and that's what I think I've spent six years thinking that as a podiatrist. Um, whereas I think if you spoke to my patients, they would tell you completely different. So Yeah, we all go through it. I, like mm-hmm. I said, I've been in podiatry 35 years and I think for a majority of my career, I just felt like I'm an imposter. Yeah. yeah. But your patients yeah. and your results and people who mm-hmm. know you, who you know, know you well, would be telling you the exact opposite. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think so. we're just hard. We're all but hard we on ourselves. Yeah. And we don't exactly ask our patients for praise either. Like when my patient says, oh, I, that feels so good. You've done such a good job, blah, blah, blah. I kind of laugh it off because that's the kind of person I am. I don't say, oh, thank you very much. That makes me feel better or anything like that. Towards the end of my career, well, before some of my last clinic, I would actually say the patients would sit there and we go through stuff and we'd be talking, we'd be getting on pretty well. And I'd say, oh, did I mention how good I am? I'm just wondering. <laughs> and they went, uh, no, you didn't. I go, oh, just, well, just say, so you know, I'm, I'm really good. So... Just, <laughs> just thought I'd point that out in case you miss it. Yeah. And we'd have a bit of a chuckle about it. And then patients would say, you're actually really good at what you do. And I'd go, yeah. I told you I was. So <laughs> all of a sudden, I re- and even though it, some people might listen and go, oh, that sounds really arrogant to say that, 
but I really think you need to believe you're good at what you do. Yeah, I think so. And, and if Usually, you're not good at what you do, is go and get nope. better at it. Look, figure yeah, out where, yeah. where your downfalls are and do more work. And mm -hmm. then, like you with MSK, yeah. eventually you'll, yeah. you'll, you'll, mm -hmm. you'll want to get more into I'll, it. Mm hmm Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> like I said, this, maybe. <laughs> me and ulcers. Don't put an ulcer near me. Can't stand them. Oh, see, I quite like all that manky stuff. Oh, the mankier, the better. <laughs> yeah. No. But this is where, like, uh, the question I was going to ask you earlier on was when you said you're not really into MSK and you would refer that on. If you're in the clinic that you're working at now, have you got other people in the clinic who really love MSK? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Yep. That's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, so my boss doesn't particularly like doing nail surgery or injections. Um, and she'll say, right, you do the nail surgery, I'll do the next MSK appointment. That suits me fine. I think I'm a wee bit of a sadist, so I love it. <laughs> yeah, I used to enjoy nail surgery. I used to really enjoy doing them until I had this kid once who did the needle, everything was fine. And as I put the, the clippers underneath, all of a sudden he screamed at the top of his voice. And my yeah. heart just sunk and hit the floor. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. the little shit turned to me and said, nah, I'm just messing with you. Didn't feel a thing. <laughs> no. I wanted to punch him in the throat. <laughs> I was so angry. <laughs> but from that day onwards, my my enjoyment factor of nail surgery just disappeared. Yeah. I didn't really it enjoy gone. it. Yeah, it's gone. He ruined no. it for me. <laughs> I wish I remember his name. I'd hunt him down. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but if you're in a clinic where you've got multiple podiatrists, I think it's great if you know your skill set and what you like to do and don't like to do. Once, yeah. mm -hmm. once I figured I didn't want to do nail surgery anymore, I had somebody else in the clinic doing. I'd do it if I had to, yeah. but I'd push most of them off. I love doing MSK stuff and sports stuff, and most of the people in my clinic enjoyed that. Anyway, it's predominantly what we did. But I think it's a mm -hmm. good idea if you're a solo practitioner, you're not really fussed on certain things is find some yeah. podiatrists in your areas and create a working yeah. network that mm -hmm. you can refer backwards and forwards. Yeah. I think podiatry is quite a lonely place if you work yourself. So yeah. having a network, um, I actually think I'm really, really lucky to have a network of podiatrists um, I would quite happily send patients to. I think it's, it's something that we probably, or something that I know we don't do enough of is refer to other podiatrists yeah. that may have a skill set better than ours in a particular area. Yeah. It'd be like when we, one of the clinics that we set up in this town called Mackay, when we set up there, the clinic was 100% sports biomechanics, yeah, MSK and orthotics. That's all we did. Didn't have an autoclave, had no instruments, nothing. If anybody came in and wanted that service, we'd refer them down the road to somebody else that we knew that did yeah. it. If we think knowing your skill set is, and what you really enjoy doing, and I think it's important to talk, like you obviously spoke to your employers about, what you like and don't like, and they were on board with it. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was the first question during the interview that I was asked, what do you like and what do you not like? Um, and I think when you're asked a question like that, you've got to be honest, because mm. as you say, why do something that you either don't like or you're not particularly good at when patients are paying a lot of money to to have that service and you're, you're kind of bringing them in and out as quickly as you can because you don't want to be doing it? Yeah, well, I think what a good idea with employers too sometimes is write down that like the top 20 things that you probably see in your clinic cut them out all on a piece of paper give them to the person who's just started with you or who's going to start working with you give them the 20 pieces of paper and say rank them in order of what mm -hmm. you really like and it forces them to actually move things around and think about it yeah. then have a look at that take a photo of it and then in three months time give them the the slips of paper again and ask them to redo it because sometimes what they think they liked, they find out they don't like and things they thought mm -hmm. they may not enjoy yeah. all of a sudden it starts changing. And so it comes back to confidence level. So they may not yeah, like I MSK because they lack confidence, but if they, if the confidence in there builds up, you'll see it start moving up the rankings. And if you do that every three months with them, you'll actually get to see what, what they put in 12 months to what they put in the first week mm -hmm. will be different. Yeah. yeah. I think it'd be quite interesting to see. Here's my tip for the day. Mm -hmm. I think that's so, a good tip. Before we wrap up, have you got any mm -hmm. other words of wisdom you want to share, whether it's about become a registered scientist, life in general, before we finish the podcast? <laughs> I'm not sure I've ever had a word of wisdom in my whole life. <laughs> uh, your Scottish people are wise. <laughs> well, I've met a few not so wise ones. 
<laughs> I think <laughs> I think if you're feeling stuck in your career, um, <clears throat> you've listened to this podcast, go and do it because why not? And then um, it'll be interesting to see how many people actually go and do it. So I would love... I would love if they told you or let me know that they've they've started the process because yeah, I think well, that would be mm. a good sense of achievement. Well, it'd be interesting because when I post this, uh, when this podcast comes out and then I start posting it in different groups, I can put that in. Hey, if you've already done the like registered scientist thing or you're thinking about doing it, comment. Because I know when yeah. you posted an article in like UK Podiatry, I was surprised mm-hmm. how many people commented or how many people were just like i didn't even know anything about this this sounds like something i want to do no i i just kind of did it as a uh off the cuff post i thought yeah oh well um i'll put it on see if anybody looks at it and if one person does it then excellent i have done something well Um, and then i think there was there was over a hundred and 60 people kind of liked it and commented on it and the number of people that said oh I didn't know this was a thing I'd be really interested to do it and I thought I am raising the profile of the profession mm. um, and making people go oh let's do that so yeah I think it was great I, I, I honestly didn't think it would get as much attention as it did oh it's going to get even more now with this podcast <laughs> <laughs> be famous. <laughs> You'll be famous before you, you get people will stop you and ask for autographs. Now believe me, that, that won't happen. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Well, you never know. So Shannon, I want to thank you for coming on the Podiatry Legends podcast. Like I said, sharing part of your story, giving us some insight on what you went through to become a registered scientist. Like I said, I thought the article was fantastic, and which is why I wanted you on the show. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me.